know what the funny thing is? This guitar has seen a lot worse. Welcome, kitties, back to the Music Survival Guide podcast. This is uh, Friday, February 16th for us. You're going to get this in a few days, as per usual. This is uh, episode number five. That's a, that's a whole hand, people, if you're lucky, which uh, hopefully you're feeling lucky tonight because we're going to have some fun. Um, Although it's the fifth episode, we kind of technically have six with uh, an episode zero. So find that one because that one's really special. I would like to thank the guys in AAA Battery from the the last episode. Although they not they were not with me in person, they were with me, you know, spiritually and emotionally. We did a feature on them. Uh, so thanks, Spooky, Fred, and Joe for sharing that and all the really really great feedback that we got on that thing. So tonight. I am very, very excited about our wonderful guest that we have here tonight. Let me um wipe away some drool because I am with the one and only <laughs> Mr. Andy Black Sugar. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Hello, Soda. Andy. How are you? All right. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Cool. I I had the flu last week and and I'm, it's gone now. That sucks. It's, so it's rough. Everybody's getting that thing. I have yeah. not. So I'm kind of. <laughs> I'm I. Crossing my fingers and toes. I, I'm pretty sure I got it at Nam, okay. and and um, last year I also got sick at Nam. So this year I went into it with my immune system extra vitamin C, extra bolstered against against um, you know the microbes. And I t- I was out there, you know, every day taking like three emergencies a day mm. and Purelling after every right. second handshake, and it no, didn't matter. Good. Well, lots of people, lots of touching of things and... Yeah, and then flying, and then I came home and... That was it. It was like two nights later, I was like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is going to be bad. No, it's it's bad this year. Um, Yeah. Thankfully, I don't have it, and hopefully I won't get it. Hopefully it'll skip me this year. But anyway, my whole point is I don't have it anymore, (laughs) so I'm great. That's good. And, and, you know, you appreciate being healthy so much more after you've recently been through that yeah for sure <clears throat> yeah i'm sure um so thanks for letting us in tonight because uh this is the first for us uh myself and monkey who is around somewhere we, we're taking the show on the road tonight we're in brooklyn which is good we road tested our little setup here and it, and it worked out quite well we we're in a very top secret location and um yeah we're going to talk a lot tonight So buckle down and uh, get ready to have some fun with us. Let's start with, uh, let's start at the beginning, Andy, the humble beginnings of Mr. Andy Black Sugar. Um, You are a a very talented individual, a virtuoso, if you will. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I I don't know if if you guys aren't familiar yet with, with Andy's work, but you should, um, Definitely fix that as soon as you can, and hopefully through this this little conversation here, if a few of you listen to it and hunt for these these artists and that that we play and that we have in here, it's really it's cool. It, it makes me happy, and uh, it's serving its purpose. I mean, this is a great thing. It's very stress free, which is nice. But uh, yeah, those humble beginnings. I mean, what made you kind of want to start playing and want to be a musician, want to be that? <laughs> that crazy path. Uh, it's the same story most people have. You know, I think I was just infatuated with the sound of rock music and particularly guitars. I just remember hearing, you know, music on the radio when I was a kid and the guitars always kind of jumped out and kind of stopped my heart, you know, in certain key moments. And, um, you know, when I when I got to be that magical age where music suddenly means everything to mm-hmm. you, you know, I was like 12, 13 or whatever. Um, I didn't have any aspirations to be a musician. I was just a super fan. And I thought guitar players were really athletic. <laughs> you know, it seemed like, you know, 
the Eddie Van Halens of the world were people that were akin to, you know, Olympic gymnasts, <laughs> you know, and I did not see myself as that type of a person. I was not athletic. I was a head shorter than everyone else in my class, you know, um, and uh, so I, I just thought I, I thought you have to, had to be touched directly by the hand of God to be able to 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 play guitar like that. But I I ended up kind of stumbling upon a guitar in a closet at my grandmother's house, mm -hmm. and nobody was looking, so there was no pressure. And I picked it up, and I kind of went dunk 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 dunk. Dunk, dunk. <laughs> I see where you're going with that. <laughs> yeah, that's what everyone probably starts with. And I was like, oh my God, am I playing? Am I playing guitar? Did I just play that riff? You know? <laughs> and then I tried another one. It was dunk, 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 dunk. Dunk, 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 dunk. <laughs> you know? Name that tune, people. <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the, you know, guitar riff 101 type stuff. But it was, it was, um, you know, it was exciting enough for me to, to, to ask my grandmother if I could keep the guitar. And so I, I just took the guitar home and I continued l trying to learn as many riffs as possible. And I thought, oh, well, this is, you know, maybe I'll get an electric and this will sound amazing. This will sound like, because this was just playing electric guitar riffs on an acoustic mm -hmm. guitar. Um, I wasn't playing them right. I didn't know chords yet. I didn't know how to tune the thing. But yeah, I, I, I got a proper electric guitar from my 15th birthday and then i mean that was really it from then on i i knew what i was going to do for the rest of my life because i i played it so much and i got good so fast because that's all i ever did mm -hmm. and there's like a positive psychological cycle that that kept me at it you know the more i played the better i got which made it more fun to play which made me want to play more which made me it you know get better and so on and um there's the ambience i was talking about <laughs> the ambulance you know, good. ambience the, the brooklyn love so yeah that's what that's all it was and and um you know one thing led to another and eventually i i um you know i i, I started getting into other aspects of being a musician mm -hmm. you know writing songs and singing and um, you know, started recording songs on a four track with a drum machine and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, it, you know, it, it all started with just wanting to be a guitar player and, and just wanting to be able to play some riffs. And the next thing I knew I was actually playing lead guitar and, mm -hmm. and then I sort of got really ambitious about being a great lead guitar player. And when I got into writing songs, that really changed my attitude about guitar because it kind of put guitar in a, in a, in a, a specific role in an otherwise, you know, much bigger universe mm -hmm. of, of, um, concerns, you know? So when I started writing songs, I was like, okay, right. The guitar is now just a tool in the song and, and maybe it's, maybe it's featured, maybe it's not, maybe it's in there a little bit, maybe it's not used at all. Maybe I use, keyboards mainly on this song or um maybe the bass guitar is more prominent um and you know i was really i was really by that time you know aside from being you know inspired by the guitar hero types of virtuosos um i was really into people like robert smith mm -hmm. and prince who were like um guitar players that use their instrument very very tactfully in their songwriting and, sure. and created these uh beautiful worlds in their in in their music that were um populated with all kinds of magical sounds <laughs> and it made me inspired to get into other kinds of sounds and and that just put the guitar sort of in um a different perspective for me so um i don't know i, I guess that's sort of an answer to the question that is, that's a great answer. Um, do you had, did you come from a musical family though, or not? Not especially. My mom is musical. She studied music in college, mm -hmm. and she has a degree in music. That's cool. But um, and she's a great vocalist, but she doesn't really perform outside of the church choir at this point. She used to perform in more professional choral groups. Um, she has performed with the Philadelphia Orchestra. 
So she's got some stuff, you know, under her belt. Um, but it wasn't like an especially musical household. I was really the only person that was really aggressively going for it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, it was kind of an uphill battle for me to, to, um, you know, convince my parents that the music I was pursuing was valid because it was this loud rock <laughs> music and my mom it comes from a classical background and so um you know conservative household it just was not it was not smiled upon this, mm -hmm. this new and obsession I, that i had you know i, I understand yeah <laughs> um so i mean you had said you started like around 12 13 ish i started, started playing when i was really just shy of 15 i got my okay. first proper guitar for my 15th birthday yeah wow cool now are you mostly self-taught yes okay yeah one of the provisos of my parents agreement to get me an electric guitar because they were kind of mortified about the whole idea what but one of the agreements was you have to take lessons because you know if you're gonna learn to play you're gonna learn properly and um you know that's part of the deal so we got the guitar we signed me up for guitar lessons at the store and i went in and i i did have some introductory lessons for probably about six months or maybe nine months and um i lost interest in mm -hmm. it uh yep, for sure the, the teacher wasn't really probably the right teacher for me and he was trying to teach me to sight read which i had no interest in whatsoever and i mm -hmm. st still don't to this day yep and I was learning so quick on my own just by ear, and I was I realized that I kind of had a talent for that. And I, and I was getting all I wanted out of it that way. And the, the, the lessons were sort of a drag every week. I kind of didn't look forward to them so much anymore. And um, I explained this to my parents, and they understood. And we, we uh, you know, respectfully um, broke up with my guitar teacher. <laughs> and from that point on, I just, I just carried on teaching myself. Um, I'm not saying that's, I, I recommend that way to go. I think if I'd had a great teacher, uh, I would have moved along a lot quicker, which would have been great. You know, um, I was just sort of on my own in a vacuum and I was just, I was using my ears. Um, but you know, I, I skipped over steps that I shouldn't have. And I picked up some bad habits that I had to you know, unfuck later on. Well, you're left-handed <clears throat> too, so it's a little bit That's already challenging a bad <laughs> for you. <laughs> well, the left-handed thing was, luckily, my, my parents and nobody else tried to talk me out of being left-handed. So I did get a proper left-handed guitar, you know, that the very first one I got for my birthday. So I, I don't see that as a handicap as far as learning. Um, it is a handicap as far as finding instruments, but... Um, Mm -hmm. otherwise no yeah um so yeah mostly self-taught yeah that's cool yeah that's great um the sight reading thing do you i mean is that something that you get into at all no no i still to this day i i mean there's just so i i have yet to find any find myself in any situation where sight reading is mm -hmm. mandatory right and the way I've, you know, and I've, I've played in a lot of musical situations where I've had to learn a lot of music really fast. And, um, I'm always prepared when I show up and, and I don't, I've never needed to have sheet music in front of me. So, um, it's just, uh, it's just not something that, that interests me. I'd rather spend my time on some other aspect of, of music, you know, other than sight reading. Um, I think that if you're in an orchestra, you have to be able to, I mean, you absolutely have to, um, maybe if you're playing, um, you know, in a Broadway show or something, there might be sight reading involved, but I know people right. that do that as well that don't sight read. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess the, uh, the plus side of that is that I have a very good ear and a good memory because I memorize the songs right. I mean, I'm, I'm the person that shows up at a rehearsal and I don't have notes. I, I don't have things tabbed out. I might have some basic notes about like, oh, this is in this key and this is where you, you turn the delay to, 
you know, this setting or whatever, but I'm not sitting there reading off a page. Um, and that internalizes the music a lot more. Uh, so yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot of valid arguments for sight reading and stuff, but you know, we live in a sound recording age. So everything that we, you know, everything that we've been listening to for the last, I don't know when sound recordings began, but I'm guessing, um, you know, very early, um, decades of the last century, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've always been very sound oriented. So, you know, the idea of um, trying to read the sheet music for Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banners is just ridiculous <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it's so much more than the notes, you sure. know, it's, of course. it's, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the atmosphere of mm -hmm. it's the setting. It's the times it was the year it was, it was, um, it was Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> it was Jimi Hendrix. It was all the intangibles. Plus, you know, the the sound is so important. You know, it's a, such a unique sound, guitar sound, and uh, it's just hard to get that from dots on a sheet. Sure. You know? Sure. Um, now, you've been involved in a lot of bands, projects. I mean, you have your own Black Sugar Transmission, which is like your main thing. Yeah. And uh, another band, Prisoners of New York, which is kind of like a side project kind of like i guess y your other more not serious but main band at this point or is that all or do you consider that really a side project too um <clears throat> well it's it's a it's a band that i play in that uh is not my baby so it's not um it's not something that i sweat a lot about i kind of show up and play mm -hmm. and it's really fun it's partly fun because of that right like, because i don't book the shows i don't book the rehearsals right for sure um i i'm i'm not really um a primary songwriter in that band although i do chip in and um Shane, the lead singer, is the main writer, and he's a very good friend of mine. You actually saw him play drums in Black Sugar Transmission. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I want to mention that too. That the the live kinda yeah Black Sugar Transmission. Yeah, he was the drummer for a little while, and cool. he, he's just a very talented guy. He's great drummer, great singer. He's a good guitar player. He's a good keyboard player. He's a good engineer. He knows how to do all the stuff. So I just, you know, it's him and his brother on drums and um, our friend Fernando on bass. So it's just like good people to hang out with. It's fun. It's light. It's not, it's, right. it's well, not That's stressful. what you want. That's what you want. I and I get that, to, that's rare. I get, I just basically show up and play a lot of guitar. You know, we tune down a half step and I play. Mm -hmm. the, the whole thing? The whole thing is tuned down to E flat. Yeah. Wow. And um, which is fun on the guitar. You know, it's a nice spongy feel. And um, it's kind of like the old Van Halen sound. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and of course, KMFDM is the other, you know, really big thing that I'm doing right now. Yep, that, that's another thing I want to I wanna really touch on. But um, let's start with like the late 90s, early 2000s, when I guess you kind of started to be a little bit noticed, yeah. if you will, with pop star kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the first record that you had put out, This Is Pop Star Kids, was like a big college radio hit. Yeah. And then from that, uh, CMJ kind of took note and you got on that here. Mm -hmm. Are you from New York, Andy? I'm from Pennsylvania. Okay, I thought so. And I, I moved here in the late 90s and uh, Pop Star Kids was really the first thing that I, that I uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, put of myself out there on the map that was that that started as a solo effort too though didn't it yeah it was basically i, I mean i tried to make it a band in the beginning mm -hmm. i was putting ads in the village voice and so on ads remember those guys remember <laughs> that? Remember that? Remember when that actual happened? print ads those were the days that's um, the fun yeah and and um i just I just wasn't finding the personnel and I think it was partly because I just didn't have anything concrete going on that people could say, Oh wow, this is a, this is like an on, this is, this is a, an active entity that I can 
join. Right. It was more like a concept, and I I loved the idea of having people come in and help me mold the concept. But it just wasn't working out like that. So I was like, "Fuck this! I've got the songs. I'm just gonna make a record, and it's basically gonna be a solo thing with drum machine." And that was the first. That Pop was Star that was the first record. That was mm. actually the first two were done like that. Um, but once I had that first album out on the map and it had all that college radio play um how did you get that though like maybe you can even give people some some tips on how you know you you moved to new york and you i had a part decided to make a record and yeah I, I i made a record and it was actually i didn't even make it in new york i made it with um in jersey right a guy yeah in new jersey had a, a studio called crystal pig i think he still has it and mm -hmm. um he was using cakewalk Okay. I don't know if you remember that. Yep, I do. Totally. And uh, and uh, two ADAT machines. Hmm. That's how we made that first record, the first two. And um, yeah, and, and basically, uh, the, the way we got all this play on the radio was I was working at a college radio promoter. Nice, okay. I was working, uh, it was just a part-time job. And that was in New York. <clears throat> that, that was in New York, yeah. I was up on 34th Street. And... Um, and, uh, you know, at some point, um, you know, I asked my boss, I said, do you think, you know, I got this record and what if we just throw it in to our promotional <laughs> cycle, this, this go around? And he's like, yeah, sure. You know, you can, you can promote it here. So it's this really great, that's great, free opportunity mm -hmm. to promote this album. And I, I didn't really tell everyone I was a person that sat on the phone and talked to college radio music directors. And every week I would try to get these people on the phone and I'd say, Hey, did you get, uh, we sent you this, 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 and this, did you get those? Are they getting played? Did you put them in the right format? Mm -hmm. Um, this one should probably go in this specialty format. This one should probably go over here. Um, and, and then we would, you know, we would compile the information based on how these, projects we're doing and send them to the clients every week so here's what your record is doing all across north america in college radio and AAA radio etc so we just threw pop star kids in there and um you know i have to say um it didn't get any special treatment at all like we didn't promote it harder than anything else um but people just loved it and um, all the songs on that record were in heavy rotation somewhere. Like mm -hmm. every song on that album was getting heavy play on some station. And so, yeah, it ended up charting um, in the CMJ top 200 charts for like 11 weeks or something. I can't remember now, something like that. And so, you know, the band, which was just me, was offered a CMJ showcase that following uh, October. This would have been like about springtime. Okay. So you had about six months. I had like six months to finally put the band together. And this time around, it was easy finding the band. Well, with that kind of yeah. credibility behind you at that point. Yeah. It was, a, it was just a little bit of a, a story. There was a concrete thing. Mm -hmm. There was an album. There, here's, here's what it sounds like. If you're into this, then cool. If you're not, then that's cool too. Um, people like this, it seems. And we have a gig. <laughs> so we've got we've got like something to work towards and um that's how it started and um you know that band was around for six years we made three albums mm -hmm. and um the third album was was really the best one that was truly like a collaborative thing with all of us involved in the recording and the the engineering and um you know we all sang on it we all um contributed in many different ways and um i'm really really proud of that album the first two are cool but they're they were done really quickly mm. they sound kind of demo-y to me now i would go back and change things if i could but the third album to me is like i'm just completely proud of that yeah. you know cool. from, from top to bottom and uh yeah and after six years of trying to get somewhere out of new york city we it started to falter, you know, of the band started to lose morale Yep. and I decided it was time to move on to something else. I understand. Yeah. I'm sure um, you do. How did CMJ go though? It was great because, um, 
Because that, I mean, especially at that point, people were really going bananas over that. I had a friend, um, when she first started college, she worked in like the concerts kind of area of her school where they would, uh, I guess they, I don't know if she, she booked shows, but they kind of had a poll and who came to the school and who didn't. And when CMJ came around, it was like a big, big, big thing. And I think um, it was probably close to that time that she was doing that. And I mean, everybody went bananas. So it was, I mean, is it even still like what, it, nothing is what it once was, but I mean, CMJ then must have been, must have been really great. I, I don't know really if great. it's still going. Is it? I, I don't know. I thought I thought it was, but I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, some things I feel like I, I just don't know about anymore. I don't either. I honestly haven't even heard anyone mention it yeah. in, in like years. I think so. No, it was a it was a big deal then. I mean, I, I don't know what CMJ was like in the early days, but I do know that at that point in time, it was well. That's what everybody wanted to be a part of, though. Like that was yeah. the time of year. Yeah, for like a week when everybody was running around and you can meet and hang out and do your thing and yeah, hopefully something will come of it. You know, I mean, you never know. It was, you know, it, it, it was overblown at that point as far as how many bands they booked. Sure, of and, course, and and like everything else, they try to make every every band feel like this is a big opportunity mm-hmm. for them. You're going to play for industry people, and there's over. X number of people that are going to be at this thing and they make it seem like you're going to be playing to people. Mm. The truth is most bands that drive here from Idaho, Mm. they play in a diner on Sunday morning in Red Hook. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's like, I mean, they'll book you any old place. They'll put, they'll book you in places that are not venues at all. Like not even a little bit, but we got lucky. We, we actually got a decent venue we played at the parkside lounge which is still there amazingly it's a small little place but it's got a stage it's got a pa and it was a saturday night Mm. and it was nine o'clock on a saturday night all right so it's about as good as you can get for just a brand new band sure playing their first show and we had like college people there that knew the record and we had our friends here and it was packed and I think it was, uh, you know, re- really successful show, and it went as well as it could have. You know, that's cool. Yeah. So, if uh, if you were to introduce people to Pop Star Kids, what song would you play? Because let's let's play something. I would play the first song off that third album. It's called Black Days Techno Nights. Okay. All right. So let's do that. Black Days Techno Nights here on the Music Survival Guide podcast from Pop Star Kids. <laughs>
Okay. Did that melt your brain? It's a good song. I was listening to a lot of your stuff. I mean, I listen to a lot of your stuff anyway, but there's so much of Andy Black Sugar to be had. I was <laughs> hanging out on Bandcamp for a solid hour before we uh, drove over here doing doing some more homework to make sure I have all my ducks in a row, of course. Now, um, two more records be- from the first one followed. The third one is like your... yeah. I, as far as pop star kids go, that's that's the one. Yeah, that is your favorite. Okay, um, then there was a little bit of a break, and then you transitioned into Black Sugar Transmission with the first release from two thousand seven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So another solo thing, though. It started out exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it okay. was just like I'm gonna record some stuff and come up with the sound and get my bearings and decide what kind of direction this is going to be and then you know well seven seven releases later though yeah i mean well the the difference is that i didn't this time i really didn't have as much motivation to to really push the live mm. band mm. aspect of it in new york i felt like i'd had enough of um you know the band mill and, mm-hmm. and um, just the lack of incentive for doing that. And I came to the conclusion that I was okay with this thing being kind of like um, a solo thing that I can work at whenever I feel like it and I can make records. And if I feel like suddenly inspired to do live shows, I could probably put a band together and do some shows. But it's not going to be like, aggressive as far as like trying to make the band take off right just of i don't care about that anymore mm-hmm. um yep and so um it's you know but the the great thing is that starting black sugar transmission was when i put the studio together here mm-hmm. and i started finally making proper records on my own and being able to finally control every aspect of the sound and um you know, so to that extent, I feel like I'm fine. You know, like this this band or this project, whatever you want to call it, is is really where I've been able to maximize my potential as a mm-hmm. songwriter. There's a lot of sounds on yeah. these records. Um, that's a net. That's another. I mean, the the world of Black Sugar Transmission is a. Uh, I mean. I was listening to the In the City's Arms, mm-hmm. right, uh, today. Double Disc, which yeah. is the latest one. Yeah. Is that like a year and a half old now? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, because I, I wrote that up. I did a write-up for that and Violent yes. Muses yeah. on the blog before yeah. we kind of transitioned into less writing, more talking, which is good. Yeah. Um, but I mean, besides your own records, though, you've managed to again. This is all Andy by himself, uh, for the most part, with some of his cool friends coming in to kind of lend their their talents here and there. But you've managed to license a lot of music to like TV and film or whatever else, right? And I mean, some. And I'm not talking like completely independent under the radar stuff i mean we're talking like network tv shows yeah mtv right which is still a thing everybody if you can even yeah it. but um they, do you do you pursue that a lot or is that just kind of come because you put stuff out and people are like well this is i gotta i gotta reach out to this guy i mean how are you well i have an agent so i don't okay. have to really worry about i don't actively do anything except make sure that my you know, every time I, I make a new record, I, I I make sure that my agent knows about it. That's and, great. And hopefully we'll, we add a certain number of songs off of each record to put in their little stable, their library. Mm-hmm. And then they do the pimping. So um, I just kind of sit back and occasionally I'll... They don't even tell me what, you know, placements we've gotten or anything. I'll, I'll hear about it through the grapevine. Somebody will say on Twitter... Hey Andy, you know it was really cool hearing your voice on um, blah 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 TV show. And mm. I, did, I had right. no idea; didn't know the show existed. That's super cool. Did, and 
But yeah, I mean, it, it's basically um, it, most of it is cable. It's stuff mm. like Showtime, MTV, and that stuff. You know, as many great shows as there are in Showtime, whatever those networks don't pay any money really. Mm. I mean, it's it's a little bit of money. I get a check every now and then for right. maybe two hundred and fifty bucks. Okay, but the network, the big networks, are still the ones that pay. Mm. So, you know, I had but Showtime a, isn't considered a big network anymore. No, I'm I'm talking about ABC, NBC, and CBS. Okay. Those are still the Those ones are the heavy hitters, yeah. That have that like if you get a song on a primetime show on ABC, um, you know, just as a for instance, I had um a, a song in in a, a show called Don't Trust the Bitch in that's, Apartment Twenty Three. That's the one that I was going to mention because okay. that is on 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 those. It was on one of those networks. Yeah, ABC. Right. Okay. And that was a primetime show, and the song was just barely barely discernible in the background of a mm. party scene i mean i would never have noticed my own song it was right. so faint and it was so fleeting but that paid so much more mm. than for instance i had another song featured it was featured in its entirety on a netflix show i don't even remember what it was called right but it was like a montage with a black sugar transmission song featured like in the foreground you know so like it's just weird like a little tiny barely perceptible snippet on abc is going to mm. pay like five times more than a featured uh you know a featured song in, uh, on a smaller well as cool as network. it is to be like in the indie circuit you want to you want to get out there to, to the big stuff. Of course. I mean, it, yeah. I think we were saying this maybe off of one of like the first one or two episodes. Like nobody starts out and doesn't, you don't want to not be successful. You know what I mean? I guess somewhere down the line you might be like, oh, you know, like I'm too, I'm too cool for that kind of thing. But then you, you get, you realize that that's, you know, you're going to make some decent money off something like that. Well, I, I definitely know that I don't want my songs to be in a McDonald's commercial. But can you regulate that then since you kind of don't know where these things are going? I mean, can something pop up in like, you know, like a, like yeah, a, like I, a Tide commercial? We, we, we have, we have basically a, um, an agreement about mm. the commercials, which is if, if you have one, if you have like a, someone's biting, I want to know what it is before you you give the green light. Um, the other stuff I don't really care about. I mean, these these shows, some of them are reality shows. Mm. Some of them are um, some of them are good. You know, right. some of them, most of them, I never heard of because mm. I don't have cable TV. I don't have TV. I don't know what's out there. Um, but as far as like, you know, the whole thing of being successful or whatever. Um, you know, I I need to make sure that I'm making my living from music, and you know that y you have to be pursuing all the angles in mm -hmm. order to make that happen. Right. And of course, this is one of those things that there's no. And it reason. is not easy. So it's not easy, but but um, you know, there there's no uh, to, to me like it's a no brainer if I can have songs out there making money for me while I'm sleeping, mm -hmm. then uh, I should be doing that, you know? So I haven't made any, you know, I haven't had any like big stuff like movie soundtracks or anything like that. Um, but it's just another little avenue of income, you know? It's, sure. it's just another slice in the pie. And, you know, th making a living as a music, like the reason I was able to quit the, the job being a promoter mm was because I had I I started thinking in terms of like what can I do with my talents you know like how many different ways can I slice up this pie like I'm a guitar player I can teach guitar sure um, I'm a songwriter so maybe I can write song maybe some of my songs could be used in some kind of commercial capacity um, I produce my own music maybe people would want me to produce their music um or arrange or help uh you know in more of like a studio capacity so you know it's it's all these little slivers of income are my radiators on is that that the buzzing 
Oh yeah, that's finally what, getting some heat. That's what it is. Good. <laughs> that's good because it's getting cold out tonight. Cool. Yeah, uh, we when I when I <laughs> when I showed up, I was like two doors down. I was ringing a whole bunch of doorbells that were not Andy's, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's so cold. And I was like, oh, all right, because Monkey's with us, so he's hanging in the back. And I was like, let's go sit in the car. Maybe Andy went out to get something to eat, or he's like coming from a rehearsal or something. Maybe we beat him. And then I, I sent you a message, and you're like, you know, this is my door. This is my number. I'm like, shit, I totally ring and running a whole bunch of other people. Yeah. Which uh, I haven't done that in a while, so I guess that was kind of fun. <laughs> you got the old thrill, the old <laughs> but, ring and run thrill. But even when we got here, we were ringing the wrong bell on your door anyway. And I was yeah. like, ah, but I... I get it now. We figured it out. We broke the code down there. Okay. So. <laughs> well, anyway, so the listeners should know that my radiators are turning on now. That's the. Uh, I, I thought it, there was like a tape rewinding somewhere. I was like, oh, that's, that's what it funny. sounds like, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. I was I, like, what is going on? Because I mean, we're not. You know, we're not going through any sort of tape here. That's for sure. Right. But uh, anyway, that's funny. So it's the heat. So you're finally getting heat. So that's good. Yay! Yeah. Yay for yay for heat in the yeah. winter. Um. So one more quick thing about this music that kind of just lives out there and does a whole bunch of cool stuff for you. Now, are these songs that have been on your records or do you write pieces to give to your agent? Like jingles, kind of. Uh, no, they're songs that are, you know, th I wrote them to be on an album okay. to put out for, you know, public consumption. Uh, I have done... I have done a couple of things, um, like made to order type pieces mm, of music sure. for, um, I did do a, a thing for a commercial once. Um, and I did, I, I, I was commissioned to write a potential theme song for another MTV show. Mm. I've done a little bit of that kind of thing. Uh, I'd like to do more of that actually. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of fun, but it's, it's a little bit weird because when you do things that way, uh, you're working with a whole committee of people on the other side that all have opinions right, about of everything, mm -hmm. and they're not musicians, and they <laughs> all, a lot of times, they all just want to have their opinion be heard, whether it's constructive or not, just because they, they just want to mouth off. Yeah, exactly. It's all noise. It's all noise. Yeah, totally. I mean, so it's kind of it's kind of nice to just give my songs that I've already written to people and say, you know, um, this is something I, I'm very proud of. And if this, if this enhances your TV show, if this, if this embellishes the scene in some way, sure. cool. That is awesome. I mean, um, managing to secure an agent actually is also very difficult that people might not realize that either, because I tried to do that for the longest time. Um, with a young adult novel that I had written. Ah. And you got to query and query and query, and then you wait, you wait, you wait, and then you get rejection letter after rejection letter, and they tell you that they're not looking for new talent, which is crazy, because I don't quite understand that they, they want J.K. Rowling, they want Stephen King, they want those people to just continue to write books. And right. they don't want to give anybody else a chance, although you might have something on your hand that could be like the next humongous thing. So I ended up going with like a really small company out in Florida that put my book out and it was, it was really cool. Uh, I wish, you know, of course that it could have been like on a huge scale, like on Penguin Press or something like that, something big, but uh, it, either way it's rewarding because you did it. Yeah. You did yeah. it. You, you reached the end, you know, and a lot of people don't even do that. Yeah. That's great. I mean, so, you know, but the agent is awesome. So that's cool. See, I didn't know that. I mean, I know we, we've talked about a whole bunch of things and known each other for a, a long time, but We've never had this kind of a conversation. Yeah, which is it, it and it will be televised. Well, I lucked out go. because I, I got the, I got the connection through a, a friend of mine who did mastering for for this agency. He he would master tracks for them, mm. and I, I was having a beer with him one night, and I said, you know, I really want to be getting more out of my songs, and I, and he goes, you know what, this agent, you know, they hire me. They're a licensing agent. They hire me to master stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you in touch. And I, I sent them some stuff, and I, I lucked out. They were like, "This is perfect. Like, this is exactly the kind of stuff we want." It's like, it's, it sounds modern. Yeah, edgy, it's edgy. But sure, but there's like, 
melodic stuff in right. it. And you know, that's what they wanted. So that, I that, lucked out. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Um, but ooh, something fun that I, I want to talk about in the way of you, you know, not necessarily getting into TV shows, but compilations. Uh, and this is really fun for me because I think I've referenced this band on every show so far. Yeah. So back in 2007, there was a compilation that came out called Sensory Lullabies, the ultimate tribute to, drum roll please, because I haven't said it enough, Jellyfish. Jellyfish. Yes. So um, Andy uh, lent a wonderful rendition of The Ghost at Number One to Sensory Lullabies, which came out on Not Lame Records at that time, right? Yes. Bruce Brodine. Yeah, spearheaded that whole thing. He just closed that, you know. But actually, it was on Burning Sky. Records. It was, yes, yes. I don't, Bruce was involved in that, though, wasn't he? I was think he might before? have. I he might have distributed it on Not Lame. Okay, Pop Star Kids was on Not Lame too. Really, that's cool. I yeah, didn't know he that. he put out that third record. That anyway. is great. Um, but yes, it was on Burning Skies. You're absolutely 110 percent right. Yeah, because I see the logo right in my head right now too. Uh huh. So let's talk about that. I mean. Both of us being like jellyfish people. Yes. Uh, extreme jellyfish people, I think. Um, how, how, how did you do that? I mean, was that kind of the same scenario or did you see like an ad be like, you know, we're looking to put this cool compilation together for this band that really not a lot of people even knew so much then. To me, I think that jellyfish is probably the biggest they've ever been right now. Yeah. Then they were back then. 1990, 93, they put out these two like unbelievable records, yeah. which you know that are like, mm-hmm. it's just crazy. It's crazy, crazy. And again, I, I'm, I've said this in, in other episodes, and it's like it, repeating the same thing over and over again. But that, that could be a whole nother show. Yeah, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll be happy to pile on with that conversation. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, 1990, they put out Belly Button, and I was, I was just a little kid, and I looked up and Andy Sturman was standing up playing the drums in this wonderfully in pur- purple outfit mm-hmm. in the that is why video with a whole bunch of swirlies mm-hmm. and Roger always said that they were like thrift thrift shop drag queens he had yeah. or something which was yeah. which was so right on and um, the the argument with them is that their image kind of <clears throat> excuse me stalled what could have been their huge, huge success. But I disagree with that so much because that was just a part of the ultimate enjoyment with that band was their image. I mean, when you watch the King is Half Undressed video and it starts and they're like walking over this mountain and they're just decked out in these unbelievable outfits with these hats. Another funny thing about that video was uh, pointed out all these years later is that they're not playing any instruments at all in that. That was the first video that they did, and the only thing they're doing is shaking tambourines in that video. Hmm. And there's all this crazy shit flying out of Andy's head. Right, right. And it's like... I remember that. But they were like MTV babes, man. It, it, all th- all their videos were like on MTV, and, you, and you're like, what the hell happened? Yeah. But, I mean, we're totally veering off. But- I know, but I was just... It's funny that you brought that up, because I was just today watching... A, um, a live stream, this guy on YouTube, his name is Rick Beato. And okay. he has this great YouTube channel and he does a lot of music theory stuff. But he um, he does live streams and it's sort of like Q&A type stuff. Mm. Somebody said, why do you think Jellyfish didn't take off? Was it the <laughs> wrong time? And he said, yeah, I actually do think it was just the wrong time. I mean, it was just grunge. Well, was- yeah, that was the dawn of grunge. The hair was kind of, they were like right in the middle of that. Yeah, and they were like these psychedelic songwriters. I mean, as far as that kind of songwriting goes, like Andy and Roger are, are like at a whole other level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even Jason Faulkner, like all those guys. Oh, but yeah. Andy and Roger were like the brainchild children behind Jellyfish. But I mean, Jason Faulkner clearly has gone on to do like unbelievable stuff. Chris Manning, all of them, Eric Dover, Tim Smith. I mean, they're all doing things that are amazing but um i love andy and roger so much and i could talk about them forever andy is like i just it's mind it's mind-boggling you know and 
I think I sent you like a bunch of his demos a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, I still have them. Yeah. Those songs are so scary. Yeah. And they're quote unquote demos. And I'm like, what, what is going on here? Yeah. Th- those guys. And I mean, he's, he's disappeared. Not, he's real quiet. You know, he writes for like, Cartoon Network, which is awesome because I love cartoons. So when an Andy Sturmer piece pops up in one of these cartoons, I'm like, woo! I know right away. Yeah, I know right away. You know, you feel it. He's just, I mean, he's he's perfect. It's it's sick. Yeah, it's so sick. Andy, where are you? Come hang out with us. I know. <laughs> I um when I when I submitted my song for that that tribute album. Yeah, let's get back to that because <laughs> Well, because we can keep we can keep talking about jellyfish. Yeah, it's yeah, but for sure. the way I found out about it was on MySpace and ah, I had yes. just I had just started Black Sugar Transmission and it was just a MySpace page at mm. that point and I had just got my studio and I was learning how to use it and I was I had already recorded some preliminary, you know, stuff and um I saw this thing and I was like, it was like a bulletin. It said, well, that's when they used to kind of have that little sidebar where stuff would pop up. But if you didn't catch it, like as MySpace grew and grew and grew, it would be washed away. So you'd miss out like a lot of cool stuff. Like the same thing with Facebook, like right. the one out of like a hundred things, like the one good thing out of a hundred crazy, stupid complaints that somebody posts, you yeah. miss it because that you're drowned out by all the nonsense. Yeah. I don't is, remember what, I don't remember the evolution of the, of the bulletin board on, on MySpace or where it was at this particular point in time, but it was, it was late 2006 hmm. and I saw a bulletin jellyfish tribute album looking for, looking for artists. That's so to cool. Contribute. And I was like, <laughs> me, 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 me. And um, I, I, I sent them um, a link to the Pop Star Kids MySpace page. Mm. And I said, this is, this is what I do. This is mm. like, I, I've got this new thing, Black Sugar Transmission, but this band, you can tell we were influenced by sure. Jellyfish. You can tell that I'm into vocal harmonies, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. And um, that guy was like, great. And I saw the list of songs that was available, and right. Well, I mean, they did both records. They did plus B sides. Yeah, they did everything. Yeah, I which mean, virtually, was wild. They did virtually every right. recorded. It was really, really nuts. It was nuts. It really was. That is a cool thing. But um, to my surprise, Ghost at Number One was not taken. So I said, I didn't even think about it. I was like, I'm going to do that one. Okay, because that's what I'm going to say now. That's not exactly like an easy thing to do. To me, anybody that tames the idea of covering a jellyfish song is definitely brave. And you did that by yourself. Yeah. You didn't have like four other guys guys trying to like figure everything out with you. How how did you do that? Because the music, not only the music, but the vocal stuff is where it gets even trickier with them. Yeah. Well, I mean, the drums I programmed. Right, that I know. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm, you know, that that's relatively easy mm-hmm. to do. Um, yeah, actually, as far as Jellyfish goes, that's a sort of a straightforward song. I mean, it's it's not... Even the more straightforward stuff, though, for them is, is in a different kind of category, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just took it one step at a time. I program. I just started from the ground up, mm-hmm. and I programmed the drums. And um, I think I changed the key slightly because okay. it was. Um, I think originally um, in D sharp, which is an odd key on the guitar. So I thought I'm just going to nudge it down to D. That'll take it down a half step. That'll give me a slightly easier time with the vocals, and I'll have all the open chords on the guitar, mm. and it'll be like home. So that's the only real thing that I, uh, you know, changed drastically about it. And um, the vocal harmonies were just a lot of fun to do. I yeah. mean, I you did such a good job. I love I, harmonies. That. Thank you. But that was really like the first proper thing that I recorded on my own uh-huh. was that song. You that's know, cool. Where I was doing the recording myself that's quite uh that's quite uh a, a wild place to start at let's play that though sure let's play that because that, that's cool the ghost at number one 
from Black Sugar Transmission, um, originally done by Jellyfish off of the incredible Spilt Milk. Here we go. Okay, so if you're a jellyfish person and you never heard that before, are you uh, like, holy moly, he did such a great job. (laughs) Uh, Funny thing about that is that came out before you and I had met. Mm -hmm. So I was listening to that thing and uh, I was like, oh, this is cool. I'd love to have this because it's, you know, related to jellyfish or whatever. But I listened to it a few times and I was like, I put it on my shelf. I was like there's a lot of great stuff and then there's some questionable stuff but that's like every compilation with like 30 plus songs you're gonna obviously have some things that and i'm not i'm not being like a snot or anything i'm just saying like that that's my opinion so but um there's a lot of brilliant stuff on there too as well of course but you and i came in uh to contact because of a mutual friend ac slade yeah uh at the time ac was producing um my band his mighty robot our third Mm -hmm. release uh, while 
he was just kind of laying down the groundwork, I think, at the time for the Dark Party, which you were a part of. And Andy would always, uh, AC would always come, he'd, he'd come out to Long Island every week. We had such a good time when we were doing that. And he's like, oh, I've got this shredder. I've got this shredder. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, you know, I mean, I was curious about the whole project anyway, because um, AC is such a hard worker. And s- since that time over the past 10 years, I mean, he's done like insane stuff, big 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 and now especially you know it's wild with, with the, the misfits. misfits i mean i haven't seen him probably in two years but think of him often i i like his stuff on instagram you know that that's that's the relationships a lot of us have now is social yeah, that's media right. that's right but um good for him the nutella loving ac slade hi ac i miss you I haven't seen you in so long anyway <laughs> so uh that's how we met and after we talked a bit i was like wait a minute hmm and then i went back home and i was like holy shit i was like "Ooh!" i had this such this super <laughs> geeky music moment i was like "Ooh, that's that's that guy holy cow and um then i was like oh man i can't wait to talk to andy again you know but uh that w- that was just so funny because i didn't i didn't put that together at all you know until we met and then i, I don't think even right away i think even down the line i was like oh crap that's totally andy's song yeah that was cool another thing on that on that compilation though which blows my mind and well eric dover from jellyfish who unfortunately didn't get to play on any of the records because he came on board to promote spilt milk as like a touring guitar player and backup singer or singer rather because they all sang these beautiful you know vocal parts his cover of that is why is unbelievable. Yeah, I fucking love that so much. God, he's such a crazy singer too. I mean, he sings from his toes up. Yeah, like, yeah, it's true, unbelievable. True. When he did slash a snake pit too, like holy cow, like that guy can sing such an animal. He's an animal. Eric is such a crazy singer. Yeah, that was. I remember that was sort of a big coup for that project. Yeah. getting him involved. Sure, sure. It's like here's a yeah. I mean, you would know jellyfish. more than me at that point because you were, you know, in in that you were in it. Yeah. You know, rather than me just ordering this thing and be like, holy cow, there's like 35 songs from all these different people covering Jellyfish. Yeah. And that Eric, yeah, that that was mind blowing. I mean, his project that was under Sextus. He did it under. Right. Have you heard any of the Sextus stuff like outside of that? I think I I think I did at the time. I I went and sort of investigated. Stranger a bit. than Fiction that album. Yeah. You love it. Yeah. It's glammy, it's poppy, it's crazy. It's it's wild. You need to pursue that thing. You know, I and you're going to really love it because I, I he's like to, on your wavelength, Andy. Yeah, really, I believe you. Really, really on your wavelength. I mean, I love I love uh, you know, Imperial Drag, obviously. Oh god, of course. When Imperial Drag first happened, um the same friend who was uh, doing like the concert thing at her college she was like, jellyfish broke up, jellyfish broke up. I refused to believe it for the longest time. And she would call me at like 2 o'clock in the morning when Boy or Girl debuted on like Alternative Nation or 120 Minutes, whatever. Yeah. When it was on once in a while. And I think I had to like get up for school super early. And I missed it. I missed it every time. So I only wound up seeing Boy or Girl like way after the fact, you know, like online. Right. Years later because I never caught it when it was happening. But I did get to see them at Tramps. Really? Oh, yeah. Holy cow. Wow. Andy, man, forget it. Right up front, Eric was like spitting on me. It was fucking wonderful. <laughs> it was so good. Inadvertently spitting on you. Yeah, not on not on purpose. Right. Just singing like that. You're yeah. catching a lot of, you know, yeah. good goodness. And yeah. I'm like, oh, shower me. It's totally okay. <laughs> it's totally okay. Um <laughs> That was amazing, though, because I missed Jellyfish. I was just a little, you know, I was too young. And, uh, man, 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 I missed Jellyfish. But, God, Imperial Drag. Did, did you see them? No, I was going to say. Because they played at uh, Coney Island High, too, shortly after that, which was, like, one of my favorite places. I had to sneak in there all the time. It was the best. You know, I didn't know. I didn't uh, I didn't get into them until after they were gone. Man, um, that, that album's unbelievable. The bass huh? player for Pop Star Kids turned me on to them because uh-huh. we, we started talking about Jellyfish and then he was like he's like, Well, do you know about Imperial Drag and the Greys? Oh god, and the, the Jason Grays. Faulkner solo albums. Yep. And I didn't I didn't know any of that stuff. That's the thing though with Jellyfish is like 
it wasn't a band that made two records and then totally disappeared. Maybe yeah. did a, a few things here and there. Jelly, the, the tree is wild. Right. Because, I mean, even before Jellyfish, you had the Beatnik Beach stuff. Right. Which Chris Kettner was in, who was like a big new wave guy in California. And I think he was about 10 years older than Roger and Andy at the time. Uh-huh. So he kind of took Andy on and just watched Andy blossom so fast <clears throat> into this crazy drummer. Right. Because he sang... He wasn't like the lead guy in Beatnik Beach. It was him and Chris. That <clears throat> that record's really great too. Yeah, it's very college radio. It's like got like a really n- neat aspect of new wave almost in there too, which is really cool. So if you guys don't know that, I mean, Beatnik Beach pre Jellyfish stuff is really really cool. I think that album came out in like 1988, and then it was reissued years later. But you're right. There's there's That's just great. the tendrils just go out in every direction it is, from Jellyfish. It there's is glorious. So much great music because mm-hmm. they're all prolific. And For sure, they're just Absolutely. all great writers in their own right. Even even the people that you know that that weren't allowed to be writers in Jellyfish. It turns out. Look at look at little Jason Faulkner. Yep. he's an amazing songwriter on his own. Just a few months ago, I saw. Um, This video of Noel Gallagher, because I think he's got, he's in a band, I think Tim Smith is in his band. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Noel Gallagher has fantastic flying birds. It's something winged, something like that. Mm. But uh, I think Tim Smith plays with Noel. Uh, He he was the more tolerable of the two in Oasis, right? Liam is the super snotty, big mouth. Okay, yeah, Yeah. Noel was like telling the story about how he sent like a couple of songs out he needed bass. And he's like, if you don't know him, this guy, Jason Faulkner, is a fucking genius. He's like, I'd have those songs back 12 hours later, completely finished. And he was just like, unbelievable if you don't know the guy. Yeah. And I mean, Jason's done so much stuff. He's played with so many cool people. I mean, him and Roger are with Beck. Yeah. And they played on like the Grammy winning record, Vultures, Mm -hmm. that Beck did. And uh, Jason, I mean... So many great bands. He worked with Nika Costa, if you don't know her. I, I do. She's, I do remember ooh, that. She's wild. Yeah. She is wild, man. That's a white girl with some serious soul. Wow. She is wild. Um, Amy Correa is another really cool singer-songwriter that he did a few things with. Like you said, the list goes on and on and on. Roger um, just played on the new Marilyn Manson record, the new Heim record. I think like uh, the last or two or three AFI records or something. So they're there. I mean, they're crazy session people as well as, you know, like you said, their own prolific songwriters. Yeah. Roger's working on a third record. It's coming at some point. This, back to episode zero of the Music Survival Guide podcast, which was a phone conversation I had with Roger, which kind of started to uh, bring up the whole idea of a podcast that Monkey really pushed me into doing, which I'm, I'm grateful for. But um, you said, too, that you listened to that only recently, and that thing's about almost two years old. And you still really enjoyed it. I mean, yeah. some of the conversation was a little dated because we talked about current stuff that he was doing and the stuff that was happening at that point. But um, that was great. I'm I'm so happy that you listened to it. You know, because that was great for me. It was I was like a kid in a candy store with that thing. You know, because I mean, crazy for me to get Roger on the phone like that. It is, and it's uh, so, he was very generous, but but he you, was wonderful. You also did your homework well you didn't have to do your homework you already know everything about them so you know you you didn't you didn't get any um you know i'm sure that it must be tedious getting really clueless questions from people if you're somebody like him well i i want to make this whole podcast thing very special and i really want to know what i'm talking about i don't want to sit here um like with dead air or whatever Right. Because I, being a person who plays music and has played music forever, I've always been like a super fanboy too. Like I will never not, I will never deny that. Yeah. The things that I like, love or whatever, I am way into, way into. And, you know, for me to have the opportunity, although we're friends, to come and talk to you and do this means a lot to me. So I need to make sure that I come proper. Yes, and I do my job. That's right. You did. You so you knew things that I didn't even know about myself. <laughs> uh, place like stalker music here, maybe. Or I don't. I don't have on heels, so I can't single white female Andy tonight. But 
but um i don't do good in heels once or twice i think i sprained an ankle but it was oh, <laughs> it wasn't <no>. pretty <laughs> i know I, I i uh fractured my elbow about a year ago wearing some very irresponsible shoes <laughs> well i mean you know my pretty days are over but i i know this isn't a, a televised thing but andy's still very pretty i mean oh shush <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so let's see let's see where where can we uh Oh my gosh, we talked about so much stuff right there. That was so much fun. Yeah, jellyfish. We could really do a whole. We should. I mean, if we you, should. You know, if you ever want to do a jellyfish roundtable podcast, you know, you're in it. I, I'll definitely be into that. And that would be wicked. Um, I would love to see if. I mean, I could probably get Roger to do something, and he's super busy, but uh, he was very easy to get on the phone for that because I had. I had worked for a company that was doing gear insurance for all of these artists. Mm. Small, big. I mean, artists like my, my band, His Mighty Robot, had all our gear insured through this company, as well as like Mick Jagger and everybody in between. Mm. So I would, I, like little Steven Van Zant, like I would call his, his girl and I'd talk to them, Steve, little Stevie's Garage, that thing that he did. Yeah, and uh, I was in contact with all these people, and then when I was digging deeper and I was like looking around, I was like, "Oh my god!" I was like, "Roger's a client. That's crazy." I'm like, "Well, I'm servicing his gear, and to see all of his crazy gear broken down, like all his Wurlitzers, <laughs> all his stuff was wild. That was really fun. Wow. Um, yeah, you would have freaked over that. Yeah, that was neat, and uh, that that was a while ago though. And then this this other guy from this band Wig that I love that I think I might have told you about this guy Clark Nova, uh, who makes like he's like a crazy circuit bender now, and he makes like a speak and spell into an instrument and makes a record off of it. It's really <laughs> nuts. He's like a circuit bending lunatic. Wow. But uh, that 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 guy you'd really like too, Clark S Nova. Everybody, if if you don't know him, which you probably don't. Um, He's got a band camp too, and there's a lot of really crazy. It's not even like electronica. It's it's just different. It's weird. He's very very eccentric and very eclectic with what he's doing musically, and uh, I think you would probably kind of dig him, Andy. So maybe uh, cool. We'll have to Clark Esnova. Yeah, trade info at the end. Um. So we were, we we went off on a crazy jellyfish tangent there. So. Yeah, we did. Um. In the City's Arms is the latest Black Sugar Transmission record. Yeah. The one that we kind of talked about a little bit before. It's a, a double disc, which of, um, super ambitious. Yeah. Wh- is that, what's your favorite Black Sugar Transmission thing? I mean, I think if you're, there's a bunch of it out if, there. If so. there's somebody new to the band or new to the thing, I would say listen to Violent Muses. I think, okay. I think that's the best, you know, because it's a tight little single album, and I, I still think that's, like, probably the best introduction. And, uh, you know, In the City's Arms is, is a double album. It's completely self-indulgent, and I... There's a lot going on on there. I made that for the people that have the constitution to 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 want to listen to that much music and that you know the people that mm-hmm. are that were already on board you know it's not a place to jump in i think it's sort of like it's my physical graffiti or whatever <laughs> you know cool i cool. wouldn't tell like if if, if aliens landed f- from mars and said what's what's led zeppelin all about i would say listen to led zeppelin one just Let's start there. Or Zeppelin Four, or something like that. You know, just something that really uh, encapsulates all the strengths in a relatively tight package. I would do the same thing with Prince. I would say, Oh yeah, well, Purple well, Rain. Okay. I would say, I, yeah, I would say well, objectively. Sure, I mean, of course, of course. But you know, when you start digging in, when you start getting really interested in an artist, the double album, man, that's like that's where you get all these like beautiful hidden gems and these these little tributaries and little little um uh paths that get to be explored because there's more room to spread out so i love the double albums from led zeppelin and prince and the cure sure i mean prince even three four five disc records (laughs) yeah because there wasn't like i mean Prince, that's another podcast. Yeah. Andy. That's like another crazy. That's, I don't even know if I could really host that because as much as I know, there are people that are like. Yeah, it's crazy. Totally. Like, it's impressive. Amazing. Amazing. I'd, I'd love to talk to those people. 
you know, kind of just let them, I could sit back and just listen to that. I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, your pop star kid stuff, we, we played a song, we played the ghost of number one, your, your version. As far as black sugar transmission goes, I know you were citing violent muses as where you would start people. Yeah. Funny thing about that, that's like kind of a controversial cover, no? In a sense, is there a secret with so. that? Like, because I saw a couple of posts about, I think at one point you, someone said something about the cover and you were like, well, would you find it as appealing if it was a man? Right, right. Is, is there a secret to be, or you don't even want to? Well, actually, no, There's. it's not a secret. Um, the cover was, it's a photograph taken by my friend Natasha Gornick. She's a great photographer. She does a lot of fetish stuff. She also shot the cover for the Glamour Pantomime album. Nice. We've done, she and I have done multiple photo shoots together. And with that album, Violent Muses, I, you know, I just ran into her on the street and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, um, I'm about to finish up this new album. It's called Violent Muses. Do you have like, Maybe some pictures you want to send me. Maybe I'll, I'll pay you to use a couple of your images as album cover, you know, art. I didn't want to do a photo shoot of myself, you know, this time. So, um, and she sent me these photos and there was a lot of fetishy stuff going on. Some of it was like seedy looking. Mm. Some of it was like really <laughs> intense. Some okay. of it was a little, it was a little hardcore. And then there was this beautiful one of mm -hmm. like, you just see these legs that are tied up in pink rope and um, star spangled uh, it's gla tights. It's glamish. It's for very sure. glamish, yeah. yeah. And it's 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 like kind of playful. And <clears throat> so I remember a friend of mine who who's a publicist. Um, you know, when he saw the album cover, I was picking his brain. I was like, "Who do you think I could send this to that would review it and stuff?" He goes, "Well, uh, I just want to put this out there, but." there might be people that would be offended by that album cover as being a sexist image. And um, I thought, well, that's weird. That doesn't look, I never thought of it being sexist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a female photographer. It's consenting adults partaking in, you know, there's clearly like a, another person that's out of the shot. There's the mm -hmm. person who's bound up and then there's someone else out of the shot except for their hand and they're holding the rope. So what I didn't even realize was the person who was bound up wearing, you know, the the tights and, you know, like the cute shoes, mm. that's a man. Right. And the person holding the rope was a woman. Mm. I love it. And the photographer is a woman. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. Would that still be considered a sexist image? I don't know. That's the food for thought, guys. I guess. But there's, I don't know. but there's. Go just, check out the cover. It just goes to show you, like, how many assumptions you immediately put in course in place when you see something funny. It, when I when I saw that, because I don't know where I saw it, I, I remember you posting about it somewhere, and um, I immediately thought of um, Nuno Betancourt's first solo record, Schizophonic, mm -hmm. where there's this beautiful woman with this golden hair on the cover. And then you open the record and right on the CD tray before you even get into the booklet is Nuno taking off the fucking wig. Brilliant. Brilliant. There were guys, like I mean guys, you know what I mean? They were like, the fucking chick is so hot. Yeah. And then they get in there and they're like, oh my God, it like fucking changed their life. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Yes. Yeah, I love that too. But God... And that record is unfucking believable, man. I love it. I love Schizophonic. It's so good, Andy. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm. I'm a fan. I'm. A, I'm a big Nuno fan. I love Nuno. He knows it. Yeah. I wear his mark on my arm. You, you're buds you know? with Nuno, right? For a while. Yeah. Um, I got really lucky. It's a cool story. What? How? <laughs> how we doing? Um. All right, so I won't make it too, too long. But anyway, when he started doing Population One. Yeah. And uh, Schizophonic didn't really hit, you know, Extreme 
again, like jellyfish, I mean, they didn't break like they should have, but now they're like so much bigger and they're doing it now. Like jellyfish, I don't, I don't think is ever going to be a thing again. Yeah. I'm totally okay with that because that mystique there too mm -hmm. is really enchanting for me. Yes. Um, but with extreme, I mean, extreme is back and they're big. They're big and they so deserve it. Yeah. Um, after schizophonic, I think Nuno was quiet for a while and, uh, he started doing Population One, which was, again, a solo project thing that started. And I, be it that I love Nuno, I caught it really in the beginning. And uh, I wrote to his, <clears throat> excuse me, I wrote to his manager at the time. And I was like, you know, if you need any kind of street team stuff, whatever, like, I love doing that. You know what I mean? I, I play music, I write, I'm always musicking mm -hmm. in some, some fashion. And he was like, that's amazing. He's like, I'm going to send you like a bunch of stickers, postcards, whatever, give them out. So I was giving them out at shows. And then um, all of a sudden, Nuno like had a band for this thing. And they went uh, and did a bunch of shows. It wasn't like a crazy amount of shows. It was like the major cities that you want to go do shows. And it was like here, Chicago, maybe not, but Virginia, Connecticut, you know. Mm. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was like, Charlie, I was like, can you introduce me to Nuno? And he's like, I've got you taken care of. Don't worry about it. So I was like, all right, whatever. So I went to Virginia to see Population One for the first time. And man, it was so good. And then, you know, Charlie comes out and he's like, oh, you know, give me, he gave me a t-shirt, a couple of things. And I was like, oh, this is so cute. You know, I'm, I'm being taken care of. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. And uh, I had heard some people say that Nuno might not be the easiest mm -hmm. nut to crack, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. And that's totally fine, too. Yeah. You know, um, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if I was going to, if it was going to be good or not, uh, you know. But uh, I went back there. I went and uh, Charlie brought us backstage or whatever. And we were hanging out. Nuno comes out. And he's like going down a line of people. And I'm sitting there with a giant bag of shit. Because I'm such a loser and I'm such a geek. <laughs> I have like every fucking extreme CD and single and you know thing. Andy, I'm not even kidding you. I think I had like 20 plus things with me, right? Yeah. And he comes over to me and I think Charlie had mentioned me to Nuno. And he's like, hey man, you know. And I was like, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, hi. It was crazy because this is since I was a little kid. I mean, Nuno and yeah. Gary were like the first thing that made me want to think that I could do anything even remotely creative. Yeah. Um, and he just got such a kick out of my giant bag of shit. Yeah. And he signed everything. Wow. He signed everything. That night I had given him the first His Mighty Robot CD that we did and a t-shirt. 10 minutes later, he comes out wearing the fucking t-shirt. Nice. And I was like, this, this can't be, this can't be. <laughs> so anyway, fast forward like a week. And it's Halloween. It's like right around Halloween time. And I'm in a haunted house, right? And I miss a call on my phone. So I, I check my voicemail and it's like, hey, man, you know, we met last night. I really, really love your record. And I was like, who is this? And he's like, I, he's like, I, do, you, do you know who this is? And I'm like, who is this person? So I go into my phone. And I call back and I was like, hey, I was like, I just missed a call. I'm like, I'm not sure who this is. And he's like, you don't know who this is? I'm like, no. And he's like, it's Nuno. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's how it all started. Yeah. Is my fucking hero called me up to tell me that he loved my band's music. Yeah. That was it. And ever since then, we've been so cool and he's so good to me, man. Yeah. He's so good to me. Yeah. Thank you for everything, Nuno. If you ever hear this stuff, man, I love you to pieces. And I wholeheart wholeheartedly, I didn't even mean that. <laughs> um so much so much and i'm so grateful for that and yeah it's so crazy but that's a wild story isn't it yeah i mean i i know what you mean because i i heard it i heard that about it too did you see the population one show in new york crash mansion crash mansion no is that where it was because no. i saw them there or you know what i don't think they even played i think they didn't happened. play i was there they didn't play something happened i i don't remember it what had it was to be, was it it was like do you remember Crash Mansion? Yes. Are you sure that wasn't the one? That because I don't know when the I'm hell telling else. You, I'm telling you because they didn't you, play that one. I don't think. No, I went there because I'm friends with Robbie Hoffman, who's their manager. Manager, yeah. Robbie's a crazy guitar player too, and, Andy. Yeah, and he, uh, yeah, he told me about this show, and 
he said Nuno was going to play and Nuno never showed up and it never happened. And I was there and I waited and at some point it was like, hmm, this isn't happening. But they did play. Population One played at this other venue in Manhattan that I don't remember the name of it now, but it's was, now it's long gone. It wasn't gone. the Canal Club. That sounds, that sounds almost right. Uh, not the Canal Room. That's the one then. That's it. This wasn't this wasn't the canal room. It was some other place. Okay. They they played. They went on stage and within the first song they blew the house system. I'm pretty sure that sounds very familiar. I had to be there. Well, listen. You can hear Buddy snoring. Andy's cat, <laughs> Andy's cat is so cute, man. She's curled up here. She was so sick for a while, right? She's good. Yeah, she's doing pretty good now. She's a badass, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's not the heater anymore. It's let's see. Um, but uh, she's cute. New, so I told you I was friends with R- Rob Hoffman. Was really into pop star kids, and mm. he used to come out and see his play. That's and he, cool. He loved that third record, and he played it for Nuno. And he told me he was like, "Man, Nuno's like, how do these guys not have a deal?" <laughs> and all this stuff. So we went to see Population One at this weird place. I can't remember what it was. And it, Robbie took us backstage afterwards, and Nuno comes out and he starts making the rounds. And again, I was like, "Is Nuno like a prickly guy? Is, mm-hmm. he, is he like you know a dick?" And he comes right over to me. And he goes, so "Here's the future of rock and roll right here." And he shakes my hand. And he's like, "Man, I really love your band. I love your record, man. I love your songs. Like everything that, that's, about that's it." That's the thing about him, though, is that he he, he clearly knows quality. And I'm not saying that because of my thing or whatever. Yeah. Like the man knows his shit clearly, and for him to say that, I mean, is insane and amazing. And you you kind of <laughs> think to yourself like, oh shit, maybe maybe I am onto something. Yeah, and it's also I think that you know maybe he is prickly with some people because he's probably fucking surrounded with assholes mm-hmm. all the time and sure. people that are just out for whatever. Mm. And when he knows that you're that there's something about genuine, you that's sure. that's genuine, he mm-hmm. knows there's something like wh- whatever the word you want to use, authentic or mm-hmm. something. Right. That's when he warms up because it's like he sees something of himself, and uh, he drops his guard. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get it. I get it. I mean, because we have like a similar story. Yeah. There, there's so many cool stories that I have with him, man. It's so great. It's so great. Like I'm like this is the longest dream I've ever had, you know? Um, Cause like I said, I'll be the first to say I'm a super duper fanboy too, man. I don't, I'm, I'm a geek for this stuff. You yeah. know, this music, movies, books. If you saw the shit that's in our house, man, you, like you clearly have problems. <laughs> I'm not a hoarder though. I swear I'm such an OCD neat freak, but, um, Oh God, where else can we go? Let's, let's go here. How much time do we have? We I should- think, I think we're doing okay. Let's but make sure that we don't forget about the present. No, we're, no, we're doing good. We're 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 in there. We're getting to the present now. That okay. that's very good. So I'm excited about that. Um, cool. The 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 blog, the Music Survival Guide blog. There's an awesome two reviews of uh, Andy's records there, and a really awesome Q and A that we did back in 2014 already, yes. and that was we wicked. Can, There's yeah. lots of really cool info there, which we probably aren't even touching on here. But now we're getting more into present stuff, and Andy's worked with like. Within the past two years, I guess, like kind of like the upper echelon of like really wicked artists. <laughs> and I say two years because that's kind of like a timestamp for me because it was about two years ago today that you brought Black Sugar Transmission to the stage at the Knitting Factory for like one gig. Yeah. You assembled the band. Man. Yeah. And that was, it had to be about two years ago because I remember it was super freezing. No, it was actually it. What you're right that it was February, mm. but it was actually 2014. Get that can't even be 2014. That was four years ago. Oh man, hold on tight, everybody. You know, but time that, flies. I just want to talk about who was in the band for that show. It was Shane Smith on drums. Mm, and that's Back Prisoners of New York. He's he's the singer of Prisoners of New York. Mm. Yes, and Ava Farber. Um, on bass and vocals, she's in a band called the Netherlands mm. right now, which is one of my favorite bands. Really, um, I got to check that out. Timo Ellis is the um, he's the mastermind of that band, 
and they're just incredibly brutal, funny, um, just uh, fearless, loud, fucking primal scream music. Nice. Yeah, and and um, so yeah, uh, check out the Netherlands and Prisoners of New York for sure. So the uh, the Black Sugar, Sugar Transmission show was four years ago. My God. Okay. Yes. But. Here we are, maybe maybe two years ago now. I don't even know. Maybe my, my calendar is all messed up in my head. But Andy got a gig playing with Peter Murphy of Bauhaus. And uh, you kind of, in a short period of time, went like all over the world with him. Yeah. Like to crazy places. Yeah. How was that? Well, it was mostly pretty good. Uh Um, we, we went, uh, when I first joined the band, he was doing a tour called Mr. Moonlight. Yep. Okay. Which was his way of sort of, um, saying, okay, all you people that want to hear Bauhaus songs at my show. I'm going to embrace it a little bit. I'm going to embrace, I'm going to just do all Bauhaus all night long Uh and that's it. And so that was really fun for me, you know, as a, as a, a big Bauhaus fan, as a guitar player, it was great for, I, I was a fish in water but mm-hmm. um yeah that that tour took us to russia china australia new zealand and then amazing. um really peter amazing. and we did we did some stuff here too i mean like a little bit over in california but um the following year we did um just a regular peter murphy solo tour for his album lion that had just come out and yeah we did uh we did a uh, a, a real blitzkrieg run of south america and we did all of north america on that tour and um and then i went out with him in 2016 again we went out to um just do some european dates we went to uh spain and portugal we did a festival in germany so yeah we we man we Andy, covered a lot Andy of miles got on the globe yeah for no, sure it was, it was it was cool and um yeah there were some really good shows in there i made actually a really cool tour documentary of that run that included russia and china and australia and new zealand i made a cool really cool i'm trying to remember what i titled it it was something like um uh peter murphy scenes from the final leg of the mr moonlight tour or something like that can people see that? It's on it? YouTube, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and it's uh, it's 20 minutes, and it includes an entire performance of Bela Lugosi is Dead in Moscow, which I cobbled together from um, audience videos uh-huh, that okay. I found, and, uh-huh. and some of my own footage that I shot on stage. I mean, Peter, Peter and I actually shot a little bit of stuff from the stage ourselves with my camera, and he he kind of got into the idea of it and he, he took the camera and he was holding it over me and stuff on stage for one of the tunes. <coughs> so, um, there's some really cool and behind the scenes stuff and dressing rooms and mm. f- fun stuff like that. But yeah, it's a cool little tour documentary. Now, um, is that something that you are still involved with? No. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure. I mean, I don't. We don't need to get personal, but I didn't think so. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I did it. I, I did it until I couldn't do it anymore, mm, and uh, okay. I, I had to move on. It was just, it wasn't working for me anymore. All right. And, uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, what do you want, buddy? <laughs> Aww. Uh, you know, I loved the band, and we had some good shows, but it's. It, you know, it needs to be when you agree to do something, it needs to, t- for me, like, let's say there's five check boxes. Three of those need to be checked off for me. It can't okay. be two. It can't be one. All right, good. Well, good. good <laughs> so the though. boxes kept getting unchecked. You know? <laughs> it was like, as this deal went on, it was like, you know, it got to the point where I was like, I can't say yes to this anymore. No, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not doing it. All right. So, no, we're done. Well, good. Good for you. I mean, not never say never, but I, I don't think I don't think we'll be doing anything else. So now I know that, I mean, well, with, 
Okay, so Peter Murphy and then Black Sugar Transmission four years ago. I, you haven't played another gig? No, that was the last gig we played, so yeah, four years ago. And I know you said you can't, you aren't actively seeking the whole band thing again, but do you, do you want to? Because for me, for a while, kind of being somebody that is friendly with you and also kind of just watching from the sidelines at a bunch of stuff that you do, I didn't think that you really were kind of like wanting to even play gigs really anymore i kind of just think that you were just making your records and yeah. getting your stuff out there and just happy and content doing that and then when you did the peter murphy thing i was like oh man andy's really getting out there i don't know if you don't really like that aspect of this or not but well to put it this way running your own band as you know is like a whole different deal it is a whole different deal and i say that to people all the time and that's cool that you bring that up is for people that aren't in bands when they see everything that goes on, like as much as they think they get it, they don't get it because it's a totally different relationship from from your friends, y- your lovers, your day gig bosses or whatever. It is a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. It's a whole other thing. Yeah. Like no way, shape, or form is that not a true statement. Yeah. Like it, it, it's a whole other kind of relationship. Well, I mean, for one thing, if, if it's your band, it's your songs, it's your baby, then you take everything very personally. Mm-hmm course and and it's 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 exhausting and there's <laughs> it's exhausting. there's so much work that you have to put in and i'm i'm I, I don't know if i'm a perfectionist but i'm very very um uh, I, uh ambitious about the quality that i want to achieve and so it's a lot of work and it's the the reward at the end of it is so negligible you know and after you've done it enough times, it's sort of something that you can. A person like me, I can I can easily say like, eh, I don't know if I need that in my life. Like I, we live in a time now where I can share my music, of course, without having to go out there and play live. Um, and you, ne- you and you never know who's going to be seeing these things anymore. I mean, it right. could be nobody. Or you could get like a random email one day from somebody that's like, you're amazing. I want to give you tons of money yeah. to do something. Right. Because it can easily happen. It well, can easily happen. And, and it actually has led to a lot of stuff like that where I ended up getting jobs producing people's records and mm-hmm. people hear my stuff and they go, "That what you do sounds really cool. Like, I want you to make my record sound, sound like, like that, that, you know? Sure. So it does lead to things like that that's not why i do it but back to the sounds with you though too i mean yeah you definitely um i mean is anything really original anymore is that a a thing but as close to original as you can get i would say your black sugar transmission stuff is there because there's so much crazy so many crazy sounds and i'm like how the hell is andy making that noise (laughs) you know because there's like stuff hidden there and then there's like, and some of it even that you wouldn't think is guitar stuff. Right. Because Eventide, that company that you work with, yeah. the pedals and everything, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm like a traditional boss stomp box person, and I ventured off into like MXR not too, not too, too long ago. Mm-hmm. But I was always like, this is what I use and that is all. Right. But Eventide, I mean, is that... Are there lots of kooky sounds that they're cooking up? Or yeah, because well, you're endorsed by them. Yeah, kind of? okay. I mean, I've been with them since I, I've been with them for like ten years mm. or more. And when you went to to Nam, you you do their booth, right? No, I was actually with Atomic Amps. Okay, which right, right. is another company that I work with. Um, but the Eventide stuff, I know what you mean about having your boss pedals and stuff, because I was always kind of like that too. Until someone offered to give me some great free stuff. Right. And then I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. What does this do? Well, <coughs> funny thing. Um, I think AC may have gotten you one of these things for a gift one year, the Digitech Space Station. Yes. That was for the longest. That's the center of my pedal board. Yeah. Th- that's like a bank of 40 sounds. Some are like completely useless. Yes. But then you've got the stuff in there that's like, transcends sound yeah and people are after gigs people would always come up and they'd be like staring you know at my feet right and they're like oh my god 
And I'm like, yeah, man, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can I tell you? I got it. <laughs> but I love that thing. Yeah. And it's super rare, and it's like $500 on eBay. I mean, Vernon Reed is the one that really turned me on to that pedal. Really? Yeah. Living color, okay. Yeah, because he he he's a big fan of that pedal. And he That's always, awesome. He always has a bunch. He always buys up whatever Digitech ones stuff. are out there on eBay. Yeah. And well, they had like a sick whammy wah too. I have the whammy wah really? as well. Yeah. I only have the uh, the space station, and I recently sold a modulator, which had a bank of sixty sounds in it. But they literally out of the sixty. I think you might have had about five because they were so close to sounding the same. Mm -hmm. Every time you tick, 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 you're like, I'm just like, I'm not hearing a difference. Yeah. So like the first 10, you'd get one. Next 20, you'd get one. You know what I mean? And down the line, you'd like be able to utilize six sounds. But that that pedal is so big. It's mm -hmm. like, now you have two of these fucking things. Right, right. Where are they going to go? You know, so I was like, that thing stayed in storage forever. And I sold it on like, let go. For like right. 80 bucks the last year or something. <laughs> let go. So, Let go, damn it. <laughs> it yeah, works. I, it works. I mean, it's true. Those those pedals, they take up way too much real estate to, mm -hmm. to, to justify their existence. I mean, but they're great to have for yep. recording. For sure. Because some of those sounds are just really, they're really one of a kind. Yep. Um, the Eventide H9, which is the sort of my MVP of my pedals, you can... You know, it's probably about a quarter of the size of one of those Digitech things, uh -huh. but you can fit as many sounds into it as you want. And um, you know, so and that that is that is the source of a lot of my crazier sounds that I do. What's up, buddy? Um, she probably wants me to feed her. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, part of part of the whole thing with sounds and effects and stuff like that on the guitar is sort of you, you know it's my, my desire to to tickle my own ears and hopefully other people's ears at the same time but right it doesn't matter how many of those things you have because not everybody can use them right right like those six sixty forty sounds 40 sounds in that space station or whatever like it doesn't work for everybody right a lot of great guitar players, I think, are the ones that know a lot about space, mm -hmm. when and where to do things. Yeah. Not to be like a crazy shredder either, where you're putting like a zillion notes in one thing. Yeah. But so sparse, like, like the guitar player from Till Tuesday mm -hmm. is that guy. He I, knows. I don't know anything about this person. Oh, my God. What's his name? <laughs> um, it's a he, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I think it's Joe. I always confuse him with the keyboard player. Andy, yeah, well, that's a oh, fuck. We can't, we can't yeah, spend I know. time okay. on that. But okay, that. But space for you. Space is is you're right, and and pedals, you know, are are a way to create space, mm -hmm. and they're a way to um, paint a picture. That's for the way sure. I look at it. And Absolutely. That's why, I mean, pedals are my favorite part of gear. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never yeah, been mine too. really that interested in guitars or amps. I'm not I a gear person by any stretch whatsoever. Yeah. Like what I have, I feel like I don't ever need anything else ever again, quite honestly. I, and there's something to that because you, you have like a finite set of limitations and then it's like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to work inside. You yeah, know, I've used my, my pedal board set up in like my past three projects, I didn't change a thing. Yeah. You know, and I still managed to, to do things. Yeah. And I, again, I, I don't want to sound pretentious, but yeah, I think I, I love mean, pedals. <laughs> Brian, Eno said something like the worst thing that a band can have in a, in an album situation is unlimited funds and unlimited time. Oh, well, because absolutely that when you have all the options and all the choices, it's sort of paralyzing. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's like, okay, this is what we got. You've got this, you've got this amount of time and you've got these tools, 10 days, make it work. And you know, it's for sure. Good, good things come out of that. Absolutely. So, um, what, what, we're in February. So just a few months ago for, I think the whole of the best month of the year, October, Yeah. Mr. Andy Black Sugar wound up in a little project called KMFDM. What? How? 
How how did that come now? I mean, I don't. I'm like a novice when it comes to KMFDM, believe it or not. Mm. And I know Lucia from Drill. Right. That is how I know Lucia, yeah. and I love that 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 Drill record is yeah. again a, a lost treasure. You know. Yeah. That that's how I know uh, her. I remember Drill too. I I, ha- I had the song "Go to Hell" yep. on. Um, you know, it was on a compilation CD or something, yep. and it ended up on a mixtape. I think I got like a cassette in the mail or something randomly because yeah. I would just get stuff in the mailbox sometimes because I was always putting my name on everything. Right, right. So I got like a drill tape and I was like, oh, this is great. And then I got a promo of it. Yeah. And I loved it. And that innuendo is an unbelievable video and song, Go to Hell. I mean, yeah. that's that's the one, if you know drill, you know Go to Hell, really, because that's, she's fierce little thing, huh? Yeah. So yeah, let's talk, fire. Tell 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 us a bit about KMFDM. I mean, how how'd you get in there? Well, how I got in the band was um, I I woke up one day and had a text in my phone from Doug Wimbish. Do you know who Doug Wimbish is? I don't. Okay, Doug Wimbish is somebody you should know about. Okay, he's a bass player, and he's his influence is all over rock and hip hop history. He's on all the Sugar Hill Gang stuff, early hip hop grandmaster flash which is the good stuff that's the good i agree for sure i totally agree he was yep. he was at the ground floor on that stuff nice. and um but he's also uh i mean he's an absolute virtuoso bass player he's played with mick jagger he's played with jeff beck he's played with uh lauren hill etc cetera, etc cetera. and he's been in living color since the 90s mm. okay all right so i gotcha he replaced muzz skillings anyway um i got this weird text from doug wimbish and he says hey andy um this is doug wimbish um my friend sasha from kmfdm needs a guitar player for a u.s tour they're doing in october which was like at this point i'm reading this i bet you didn't need coffee that morning huh it was like a week and a half away i was actually on my way to go record with with prisoners of new york that morning at saint vitus and um and, uh, you know, I was like, what? How does Doug <laughs> Wimbish know Sasha Konietzko? And it turns out, of course, they know each other because they're just those kind of guys right. that they have eclectic friends and mm-hmm. tastes, and they've known each other since the 80s. So, um, so he, Doug got my name from vernon reed right okay. so I doug, know you're very close to vernon yeah and vernon's always been like a big supporter so vernon gave him my number and next thing i know i'm talking on the phone with doug and sasha and we're having a conference call and uh sasha said look uh you know these guys that we were using on guitar in in german in um the european tour we just did are are from here in Germany, and uh, the United States isn't letting them in. They That's Lord of the Lost, though. Know. Lord of the Lost, which I know those guys. Well, you played on uh, Antagony. Is that the name of the song? That's the second record. That's, That's the, the name record. of the record. Yeah, I forget which track, but right. I love Lord of the Lost. I found out about them when they put out Fears, that first record, which is my favorite. Chris, the Lord Harms, yeah. is fucking brilliant. Let's face it. Yeah, he's and and he's. I didn't realize that that was the whole thing with that because I knew that they their work visas got totally screwed. Yeah, and that they couldn't. But I didn't realize that they were like KMF DM moonlighting, if you will. Well, I'm gonna have to rewind it a little bit, but they were, and it was sort of out of necessity because KMF DM had two long running guitar players that had just sort of retired, mm. and they put out this new album. Um, with Chris Harms playing guitar on it okay. called Hell Yeah. Mm. And they started touring in Europe with Lord of the Lost opening and the two guitarists from Lord of the Lost also playing guitar with mm. KMFDM. So they were doing double duty right. every night. And, um, you know, but this is a very recent development. You know, like I said, the previous guitar players in KMFDM had been in the band since 2001 or two or something like that so but she is and they for whatever reason they, they both decided that they didn't want to tour anymore so the visas didn't work out for lord of the lost and kmfdm needed a guitar player on very short notice and um um you know so 
I love KMFDM. Right. I'm a that. huge fan mm-hmm. and um, have been for many years. And I thought, yeah, I think I can do this gig. You know, like <laughs> I think. I mean, I don't know all that. Like I haven't. I hadn't been well, paying that's attention. A big catalog, though. It's too. a big catalog, and I hadn't. I didn't know all their recent albums. Mm, right. But I know a lot of their albums. I have a stack of a big stack of KMFDM CDs. I used to have a poster on the bathroom door before it got destroyed. <laughs> I used to have KMFDM painted on my black jeans all the way down my left thigh. Um, so I was like, yeah, let's, I'll do this. I mean, I had to, I had to cancel like six gigs in New York for mm-hmm. October. But, um, you know, once I started talking to Sasha on the phone, I, I felt like uh, I just like this guy. Like, I just got the best vibe from him. And I thought, you know, who knows? Maybe this will be fun. Because you never know until you get out there and you're you're in you're living in each other's pockets. I and I went through that two and a half years ago with a band from Brooklyn. I didn't know them. Yeah, and the pocket thing. Yeah, was very uncomfortable. Yeah, it's 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 brutal until out you there. find out. Mm-mm. I mean, even even if somebody irks you a little bit, I mean, it just, just a it, it's it's well, the, you're living with them on your lap in a fucking van for two months. It just compounds and compounds and turns into yeah. It, it's the grain of sand that does not turn into a pearl. <laughs> it turns yeah. into a, a giant raging ball of cancer. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, bad. It's bad. You know, so. Um, but it did look like you had an amazing time. Well, I, the, they're great people. Uh-huh. Like, Good. I mean, once I got out there and, and met everyone face to face, it was like, oh, this is going to be fun. Like, these Good. are, this is this is where i should be i should be playing with these people good you know? well you didn't even get like any rehearsals in with them right like the That's first right. thing was like the first show it was in chicago or something yeah it was um at the metro nice headlining a festival called cold waves festival and we were supposed to have a rehearsal but there were some uh i'm not going to get into it but there were there, there were ridiculous uh, technical issues with sound engineer. The, the other casualty of the visa thing from Germany was that their sound engineer also couldn't make it mm. here. Wow. So they had to find someone on very short notice mm. in the month of Rocktober mm. when all the, uh, you know, most of the the really good sound engineers are already booked and they're right. out there. So we went through six sound engineers on that tour. Um, and the first one cost us our first day of rehearsal because he couldn't make the board work and Mm -hmm. couldn't even put together a workable situation for us to play so much as one song together. So, um, yeah, we went into that first show just, I mean, I think everybody was shitting bricks a little bit. I, I wasn't because I was going to ask you, I mean, how do you handle that? Are you, I was stressed out a little bit. Uh obviously because it's like oh this is a pain in the ass we didn't even get to practice i mean but i knew also that i had learned songs as well as i possibly could have now they gave you a set list or were they like learn 40 and we're going to do 20 no it was a solid set the whole month okay sasha said this is the set this is all you're responsible for the other thing the the other situation you described that's more like peter murphy style Mm -hmm. it's like learn 40 songs and you may or may not ever play 10 of them mm. you know so um that's, yeah it's a different situation um or i may ask you to play them well after you forgot uh-huh. you know how they go or you know right. so no it was it was you know S- sasha's very um he's incredibly german in the sense that he's very efficient and he's very organized and he quietly kind of controls everything about KMFDM. He knows everything that's going on, the, the accounting, the merchandise, nice. the routing, where everyone's going to sleep and what bunk and all that's, that kind of stuff. That's rare nowadays, especially. But he's also the person that you talk to on the phone. There's no manager. Mm. But he's also incredibly hands-off. He's like, hey, do, do whatever you want, man. He's like, half german and half jamaican he's like <laughs> i mean he's like just so incredibly easygoing but yet he knows every line of every contract so mm-hmm. he's very smart but he's also he comes from he comes from more of like a punk rock 
style of approaching things in a band. And um, yeah, so we we got through that first show and it was fine. It was like, I would say it was like 90% really good. There were mm. co- I made some mistakes for sure, but didn't really didn't really seem to affect the night too much. Mm. <laughs> like cool. Your crowd loved it. The crowd was there for the band and and then, you know, I think everybody was really super relieved after after that first show and it just like, we all just and had was, smiles on our faces. Good. And then it was just all down uh, up up downhill from there, right? Not it's uphill, sort of like downhill because it's just downhill in the in the good aspect yeah. of which like you know, you, you're not climbing yes. or plateauing even. You're just kind of enjoying the yeah. the slide back down. Yeah. Cool. Um, it was a bummer I missed the, the New York City gig because I was sick. I had like a lot of health issues for the yeah. last quarter of last year, Yeah, uh, which is done done with, thank, thank God. Thank God. But um, So I was bummed that I, I missed that gig, but it, you looked like you had a good time. And even... Yeah. They clearly embraced you uh, because at the end of that, I think Sasha even gave you like his war torn leather jacket, yeah. right? That was like the uh, the trophy at the end, like you did it. That that was the pat <laughs> on the back. That was so cool. I was like, oh, Andy, man, look at that. Yeah, yeah, totally. It was like this, you know, this piece of KMFDM history going back to the very beginning, you know, yeah. like the early wax That's tracks days. Super cool. It is. It's it's very cool, and you know. They're great people. They really are. Are you in KMFDM though now? Is that like yes? And mm. we're we're. Does we're, anybody know that? Is that like? Is that okay to say? <laughs> yeah. No. I, I. I don't. I. I would never go on the internet and say, "Hey, right. everyone, I'm in KMFDM now." Uh, um. The people will find out when the time is right. Music starts coming out because we're working on an album. So oh, that's so um, cool, Andy. That's yeah. so cool. Good yeah, for you. That's what we. That's what we've been doing since basically the following week after the tour we mm. immediately started working on new stuff so um that's great and we're gonna put out a live album from that tour so mm. we're starting to listen to some board tapes tapes board recordings <laughs> and uh sifting through those and seeing what sounds good and stuff that's awesome yeah. cool so aside from that um they, they, there's a whole bunch of little projects they've done and people here people there a lot of different things but another another guy that i want to point out that uh is in from an is from another one of my favorite favorite bands that i know you love too jason bueller from saigon k oh, yeah and i know you're very fond of him because he's another incredible musician as far as like it, playing everything singer songwriter engineer producer owning his own record label wicked guitar player yeah um and another band like extreme and jellyfish saigon kick that was just like not people didn't get it yeah they were too intelligent right with the sounds and the lyrics and even like the first two records even after matt left when jason took the whole front person role it wasn't even so so much different because jason sang like 60 percent of the saigon kick records anyway before the third record water came out which is actually my favorite saigon kick record it's it's quite it's quite a um tour de force that yeah. one yeah yep. i mean i love matt matt's amazing yeah um he's like a jim morrison kind of yeah you know on stage i mean he's really in captivating you know matt, yeah. matt's great um i love saigon kick but you like cut a tune or two with jason at some point didn't you uh we did one thing together um i have a i have a soundcloud page that's devoted to um what I call head cutting sessions, which mm-hmm. is basically instrumental tracks with me playing guitar solos against another guitarist where we kind of go back and forth and my solos are always panned in the left speaker and the other person's okay. in the right. Mostly it's guitar players. I've done a couple with, I, I, I did one with keyboard player. Um, but yeah. And, and um, you know, after I started to become friendly with, with Jason, just, on social media mm. um i said hey do you want to do one of these things and he's like yeah absolutely send it to me so we did that and um that was fun and uh we're, we definitely have to do more stuff in the future like we're i think we're we both are you know determined that we need to collaborate on something else in the future and that's so cool i'm i'm such a you know i you know i love that band and and i do and we both we both share the frustration that they haven't 
that they didn't get. Well, they're they're back too. Um, yeah, with Matt, and they do shows not not like a hundred shows a year, maybe a few. Yeah, but I mean the shows are great. Even when they were in the city last year, I mean you got up on stage and played. What well, um ugly ugly yeah yeah it was ugly nice yeah yeah I was um uh working with Shinobi Ninja that night I was helping out with their merch yeah um but they opened the show because they're buddies with Jason and Saigon right too. right um can we play that the, yeah the you and Jason kind of absolutely kind of I can't remember what that, that what that track was called but uh, I was gonna come to you for the answer to that one Andy. But we'll figure it out. I can't remember what I called it. Probably something really silly. Okay. Bang over. It's called bang over. It is. Yeah. Okay. That is a. It's silly, but it's also kind of brilliant. Yeah. So bang over. Andy and Jason Beale are like fucking ridiculous. So here's that. Here you go. <laughs> So, there's a ton of music on Bandcamp, blacksugartransmission.bandcamp.com. And there's also a Pop Star Kids mm-hmm. Bandcamp. Bandcamp is a good place, everybody, if you're not into tangible items, to go and buy music because artists see the most percentage of sales from Bandcamp than anything else. Because. Do, I, I mean, iTunes is iTunes. Everybody uses iTunes or whatever. But after like a zillion sales or whatever, you're going to get like an $18.72 check from iTunes. Bandcamp does something cool where you can group your whole catalog together mm-hmm. and offer it for like a really nice price. And you're going to sell all of your music and you're going to make like a really decent amount of money. Bandcamp will take like five bucks or something. Uh, 
So if you want to pursue Andy more, whether you know him or you don't, Bandcamp is good, right? Is that okay? Yeah, Can we say that? That's absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, blacksugartransmission.bandcamp.com. Also, blacksugartransmission.com, which is my direct website. Um, that's got all kinds of other stuff on it, too. Yeah, there was something that I wanted to ask you about because um, I know... You're not on Facebook really anymore, right? Well, I just take the I deactivate my account when I don't need to be on there. Right. But Instagram is so much more fun. Yeah. It is. I agree. I really enjoy Instagram, but you kind of do this fun little quote unquote show on there now, name that scale. Yeah. And you're up to like almost episode twenty. Yes. Where you kind of you know, you hit up a couple of songs within the, the the key or whatever that you're working on in these videos and you just you know, hanging out for a minute and then you're ripping apart the fretboard the next second. So even Monkey was saying before uh, we came over, he was like, yeah, he's like, that guy moves really fast. I was like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's, he's really fast up and down there. I was like, yeah, he's totally out of his mind. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, there's that thing, which is super fun. Yeah. Yeah. It looks, I, you know, I, you're just hanging out in your place. Like, hey, everybody. <laughs> well, what you're, you're talking about two different things on Instagram. I do name that scale, which is just sort of me playing some kind of a figure on the guitar mm-hmm. that includes a whole scale in it. And it's sort of for the, the people out there that are, uh, you know, into music theory and ear training and stuff like that. And the point is you're supposed to listen to it and be able to tell what scale I'm using. The other thing you're talking about is my favorite riff. Okay. Which was this Nikki Six show on YouTube for a while where he would have a guest guitarist on and they would talk about the guitarists talk about their favorite riffs from when they were, you know, learning in the early days or whatever and then some of their own riffs and they'd have their guitar there and it's just kind of a Yeah, cuz I've seen I thought that they were kind of one and the same but but now I, I, I get it's it. It's a similar type more. of thing. It's about a minute. I mean, I... I well, you, they only give you like a minute or 59 seconds on Instagram. They as only far give as you that, goes, yeah. Right? So the, my favorite riff, when I do it, I, I cram as many riffs yep. as I can into one minute. <laughs> and it's in it's always in one key. Uh, okay. And all of them that I've done so far are in the key of A. Um, actually, when Fast Eddie Clark died, I did a my favorite riff, Fast Eddie version. Uh, which was all Fast Eddie Motorhead riffs. Well, Motorhead's one of your favorites. And Fast Way. Right. I threw a Fast Way riff in there. Yeah, one of my favorites. So, um, yeah, that's Fast that's Way, just, yeah. It's uh, F- Facebook, I'll have to get back on there eventually. Um, because, yeah, but, uh, but in whatever. the meantime, I don't need to. I don't need it. No, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, you also offer tutorial videos, right, on your site? Yeah, I do. I have um, I have a whole bunch of different ones on there on different things, but you know, some of them are about pl- uh, just pr- playing in the different modes. Some of them are more esoteric, like uh, here's concepts about playing outside or playing exotic scales. Um, I have one on vibrato and bends, just various you know some specialized little topics. And th- those are on blacksugartransmission.com. Yeah. So that that's like HQ for Andy. But follow Andy on Instagram, too, because it's loads of fun um, with the, the name, that riff, and the, yeah. the scale thing. And then just, you know, your usual stuff that y- y- you might see on Instagram. Let's, uh, I mean, we're winding down. Yeah. So... I just want to see, well, not me, because I, I think I probably know a lot of these already, but tell us, you know, like some of your biggest influences. I mean, I could probably name some. What would you say? I would say Madonna. Yeah. I would say Motorhead. Yes. Uh, the Cure. Yes. Um, Shudder to Think. Yeah. I hear a lot of Shudder to Think in your stuff, like a lot. Well, I yes. I mean. Vocally. I, yeah. You know, because they, they're definitely snotty, and there's like a snotty, and I mean that in the best possible there's way. So, there's, there's a lot a of snotty, attitude. Yo, yeah. there's so much attitude. Yeah, I, you're right there. I mean, I, it, it would be hard for me to put them in the same category as those other bands, because to me, I really only am into the one album. Pony the, Express. Pony record. Express. It's the, so weird. The other Andy, albums are cool. so weird. But it's just that, that that album is so huge to me that it really does constitute a big influence. I just marvel at that album. I mean, every year it just gets better and more fascinating. 
It's so weird. Yeah. It's, I, I listen to that thing and I'm like, at first I was like, I don't hear any songs. Yeah. But like you said, it's one of those that you're like, okay, uh-huh, holy shit. And then you're like, yes. When the yes happens, you're like, forget it. Yeah. It's one of those. Yeah. I love, those are the best records. Oh, man. I I mean, Craig is just, uh, he's another guy that's kind of an explosion of ideas and projects. Mm-hmm. And- well, Nathan Larson, too, is no slouch. I yeah. Mean, did you ever hear that Jealous God record that he put out? No. Oh, man. That thing is unreal. It's so soulful. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, it's so good. Jealous God. It's Nathan another one to put on the Larson. list. Yeah. Everybody, if you're hearing this, man, that, that, that's. I had that record as a promo probably for eight years before I put it on and discovered it, really. And then I was like, oh, my God. I've had this record for so long and I had no clue wow. how amazing it was. And from then on, forget it. I know it from back to front now and it's just like jaw dropping. Yeah. I'm like, okay, God. that's another one to put on the list for, for tonight's it's real recommendations. Good. It's real good. Yeah. So hit us with a couple more. Okay. Uh, we got to mention Prince. Oh, well, shoot. Of course. Yeah. I mean, King's X, Queen. Oh, damn it. I wanted to say King's X. Um, Doug is so cool. Doug is so cool. Um, they're they're another one grouped into that genre of amazing that just never happened. It's it's a crying shame. And with Kings X though too, like I don't know them as well as I think I should. So I think you should speak. We'll trade some lists because yeah. I don't I don't know them like I should at all. Like I feel like I'm foolish for letting that not be a huge part of what I listen yeah. to. Yeah, well, they have a lot of albums, and you want to find out the right place to start. Yeah, so I'm yeah. counting on you for that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, did I mention Queen? Did I say Queen? No, nope. no. Nope. Okay, yeah, Queen's top two. Top really? Two, yeah. Okay. Them and The Cure. But um, Mike Patton. Right. You know, Faith No More. Happy um, birthday, Mike. That was only like two weeks ago, I think. I, he's somebody that I'd love to work with. I mean, like, He's at the top of the list, you know. Um, that would be fun. But uh, I love, you know, I mean, I love electronic music, really. Uh, it's, it's Royce all, and Murphy, it's, I know you love her. Oh, uh, Rasheen. Rasheen, okay. I, yeah, go. yeah. We were just, I just had her playing when you came yeah, in. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. Maloko and, uh, you know. Rasheen, okay. And uh, See, I'm getting schooled, people. It's good. I Basement love it. Jacks is one of my favorite bands. Uh-huh. I think they, they just have made like just kaleidoscopic, brilliant pop electronic dance records that are just so dazzling production wise, mm-hmm. like big influence that electronic music is really what has influenced me the most as a producer. And it's uh it's the maximalist stuff like that. I think basement jacks is just so loaded up with details. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I'd love to do minimalist stuff, but I just keep hearing more things, you know. <laughs> it's just the, the the details just keep presenting themselves, and I just have to try to figure out ways to squeeze them all in. Well, that's another thing. I mean, you do everything in your house, in your place. Mostly, yeah. Which is yeah amazing. I mean, all that stuff is, is really 80 or 92%, Andy, and a couple yeah. little percentage of I get other people involved. People, people that play drums, they do their parts elsewhere. If you're not programming them, of course. Well, so. yeah, I try to, I try to get drum, live drums mixed mm. in on a good portion of things, mm. and um, it always makes it more fun and For more sure. interesting. And right, absolutely. I'm actually really lucky that I have this good friend of mine, Jimmy Lopez. He lives two doors down. You were actually p- probably ringing his bell yeah. earlier. <laughs> I probably ring and ran him. He, he's played on the last three albums i think and he he comes over with all these great little percussion instruments with all these textures and cool things that i didn't even know existed Mm. so yeah whenever i bring other people in it just always makes it more colorful and interesting to me and makes me excited about the songs again i get tired of hearing my own self and uh all right well kmfdm uh we're gonna look out for a live record Mm -hmm. and a new studio record at some point is that um is there a black sugar transmission 
album in the works no or you're kind of no but I, I i might do one this year okay you know maybe maybe i'll get jason to sing on a song or play on a song or i'll get that'd be wonderful i'll get kmfdm people to <laughs> join in on a song or something that's great yeah so um anything else before we kind of sign off here what do you what should we know what do we miss because i don't know we got you got everything we got man. down to it you got the important stuff good i mean if people want to hear more of the shred guitar stuff listen to sheer velocity on okay. Bandcamp. That's okay. sheervelocity.bandcamp.com. There's way too much music on there, more than anybody could want to hear. <laughs> I covered Joe Satrani's Surfing with the Alien. And you did that at Arlene's entirety. Grocery, too, though. You played that out. We did We did a kind of a little practice show at Arlene's, and then we did a proper one at St. Vitus, opening for Vinnie Moore and Gus G, who are two amazing shredder guitar players that played for UFO and Ozzy. So that was a fun night of lots of notes, <laughs> lots of notes, lots of uh, um, good, you know, mostly male audience members. <laughs> mm. But uh, no, it was good. So, but I do, you know, for for all of the, you know, like when I was saying way back at the beginning of this about how songwriting kind of puts guitar in this little supporting role for me. Um, Sheer velocity is all instrumental, and it's where it's just all about guitar. I just right. throw as much guitar into it as I possibly can, and it's very self-indulgent. It's very <laughs> like stream of consciousness. It's very absurd. It's very all over the place, and it's just purely fun. But you know, so there's there's another Bandcamp page right there, guys. Sheer yeah. velocity. So there's, like I said, there's lots of music to be discovered uh, with Andy, which is really neat, and it's um. Lots of different personalities in this stuff. So if, if you don't like one, you might love something else. Which that's is, right. Which is great. Yeah, you know, that's true. Which is a great thing. So yeah. don't stop at one thing. To you know, try it. Try it out. I mean, variety is the spice of life. So sample sample everything. Um, I want to close out the show. Well, thank you, Andy. This thank is you. so cool. Yeah, um, man. I want to close out and thank you, Monkey. Um, because without Monkey, I couldn't even do this, really. Um, he's looking at himself in the mirror right now. He's not, <laughs> though. He's actually filming us from the other side. I just He's just admiring himself, let's face it. Um, but I can't even hear you. When I take these off after two hours, I'm deaf. Like It's like I've been in the ocean. Like yeah. I'm underwater. Yeah, yeah. But um, I want to end with playing In the City's Arms, the title track. Cool. From the double. Because... I think it's a really nice way to, to go out. Yeah. And for me, when I listen to that, since we were talking about Prince or whatever, that's very parade era Prince. Oh, wow. Like under the, from Under the Cherry Moon stuff. Yeah, like sure, I just, sure. I think of parade for whatever reason. Oh, wow. And like even, you know, I don't know. I, I just. I'll take it, man. Good, good. Thank Wendy you. And Wendy and Lisa, you know, they're another powerhouse. Yeah. God, I love them. Um, I agree. But that's it, everybody. This was another one where you needed to pack a lunch for it. <laughs> I hope I hope you had such a good time because this can't be any cooler for me. <laughs> I mean, this is great, man. It's so cool. Um, thank you, Andy, Monkey, Buddy, wherever you are. I know you're probably hungry. A a a Papa Andy's been ignoring you for that's like right. two hours. That's right. Um, we're going to go out on In the City's Arms. Thank you for listening to this. Share it with your friends, your family, and just be good to each other. You know, thank you so much, yes. everybody. We'll see, you, uh, we'll see you again very soon. Have a great night. Thank you, Soto. Good night. Thanks, Andy. White night raising a black flag under the vapor trails, killing all the sorrow away. Rich you are. Medication in the city's arms. No one's counting, so it's your fountain of youth. When you're older and it's all over, this will all diffuse. All night searching for beauty, love is transmutable. Killing all the sorrow Wish you a ruination Locked in the city's arms
spinning on a sorrow wave Each hair straight from the addition To this abandoned space Killing all the sorrow wave Bet you are Deviation In the city's arms No one's counting so It's your fountain of youth When you're older and it's all over This will all diffuse All night searching for beauty Love is transmutable Killing all the sorrow With you ruination Locked in the city's arms Spinning all the sorrow Locked in the sea